Okay. It's good to see you. I'm glad you stayed. I was thinking about Peter's triple denial of Jesus at Caiaphas's house. And it made me think, what would cause fear like that that would make him collapse as far as his courage was concerned, especially when he had been so bold in uh, saying, it'll never happen. Reminded me also of that proverb, or rather that uh, verse in 1 Corinthians 10, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall, right? But soon God brought me to consider, as I've already shared with you this morning, the natural condition of every single one of our hearts. The heart, we, uh, uh, we see it in the Bible, the heart really is the command center of our personality. That's what the Bible means by it. The heart is that inward, immaterial part of our being. At times, the heart is also the equivalent of what the Bible calls the soul. It's made up of our thinking, our feeling, our deciding. And when you compare the before and after pictures of Peter, that is, before his denial and after he gets squared away with the Lord, Following that, when you compare the before and after pics of Peter, you have to conclude that he has had a change of heart. His heart has been changed. There's important heart truths, I think, that pertain to this that I would like us to think about and consider this afternoon. And then we'll have a time of discussion. Okay, so... I want to pray, and then let's jump into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the God of our heart. We want you to really tear apart these hearts of ours, because as we will see in a moment, we don't even know them. We think we know our hearts. We don't. Lord, you do. And so would you show us? the truth about our heart as it uh, exists right now. Will you show us where we are in our walk with you, in our relationship with you? Lord, we pray that you would do this because you're so gracious to us. You care so much about us that you want us to know these things because you want us to come close, closer than we've ever been before. And that's why you allow such difficulties to crop up in our lives because that's when we run to you and when we run to you in need then you have our attention and you can work and we can hear from you and so I pray that we'd have a tent of hearts today as we think about these things may it not just be something that we go to sleep or we wouldn't take seriously. Or we'd just be here physically, but not really with a ton of hearts. Lord, give us to hear from you today, because this is what you have for us. I'm convinced of it. And I pray that you would convince us as well and do it work within us as we hear from you and submit to you in Jesus' name. One of the first things I want to submit to you that the Bible makes very clear about the human heart in its natural state is that it is deceitful. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, above all things. And in the context of Jeremiah 17, where the, the, the heart is just totally unreliable, he tells us that the person that trusts their heart, that trusts their natural heart, is under God's curse. <laughs> Cursed is the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm. 
The last thing God wants us to do is have confidence in ourselves. He wants our confidence to be in him, that he can take our nothingness and make something out of it and use us. So the heart is deceitful. It is totally unreliable. And you may think differently, but listen, you and I are ignorant of the deceitfulness, of the depths of deceit in our hearts. We're ignorant of it. You cannot trust yourself. And that's why Jiminy Cricket is off. It's wrong to follow your heart. You can't follow your heart unless you want to go astray. I don't know if you know what, who Jimmy and Cricket is. Yeah. That goes back a few years, right? And if you're not from the United States and you don't remember Walt Disney, then you don't know who I'm talking about. But anyway, he had a song, Follow Your Heart, right? Something like that. You don't do that. Don't follow your heart. If you depend upon human thinking, if you make uh, your plans without God in the center of those plans, you violate all kinds of scripture. What does the proverb say? Trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? With all your heart, lean not under your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge. And then you can have the promise of his guidance, his direction in your life. James uh, applies that in an interesting way. He says, he, he gives the, the story of uh, a hypothetical of a man that he moves to a certain city. He has a plan, a business plan in place that he's going to be there for about a year. He's going to build a business. He's going to sell and he's going to uh, make money. And James says, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring forth. You don't know whether you're going to have a, a day, let alone a year. What is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a short time, then vanishes away. You ought to say, if the Lord will, we'll do this or that. You see, the ignorance of our hearts. Again, the proverb says, there is a way uh, in a man that he thinks is the right way, but in the end, it's leading him to destruction, and he's deceived about it. He doesn't even realize it. You think you have God's plan if you care about it. It's possible, you know, to have cancer in your body right now and not even know it. I could have cancer in me right now developing and not even, it might not show up for 10 more years. I could think I'm in great health. I could think that I'm 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 good. Well, you can be deceived by your heart. And that's why it's so important that you submit to God's wisdom and to God's plan. Remember, he says, if you don't trust in your own heart, but you trust in me, I guarantee you, you'll have my guidance. He shall direct thy paths. But you know, in order for God's guidance, you need to learn how to hear the voice of your shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. Do you know how to recognize the voice of your shepherd so that you can get guidance from him? Do you know how to properly discern God's will to be able to follow not your heart, but God's heart. The psalmist says, I delight to do thy will, O God. You know how to discern God's will to follow his heart? The word of God and the spirit of God who gave it and uses it in our lives is really the GPS, you might say, for the human heart. Because our heart, it's full of deceit, and we're ignorant of it. Goes on in that 17th chapter of Jeremiah, and here's what he says. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And he asks this question, so who can know it? And the it's, it's a rhetorical question. And the answer is nobody. No human being. You don't know my heart. I don't know you, your heart because we don't even know our own hearts. Who can know it? Well, it's answered in the next verse. Verse 10 says, 
I, the Lord, search the heart. I, the Lord, search the heart. And you remember what David prayed in the 139th, the last two verses of that? He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me or try me and know my thinking and see if there be any anxious way in me, any worry in me. You know, anxiety and worry is a total lack of trust in the God that you say you know and love. And then he says, lead me in the way everlasting, in the everlasting way. So the second thing about the heart, yeah, it's full of deceit. That's why we need God to search it. That's why we must have God searching our heart. If you have physical heart problems, you go to a heart doctor. He's called a cardiologist, right? Well, can I say that Jesus, that our God, the great physician, is the greatest spiritual cardiologist? You see... God knows the deceptive nature of the human heart. And he is the only one that is capable of accurately evaluating our inner person. Because you and I, we hear what people say. We see how people look. We can judge by their gestures, but we may be off. They might be fooling us but God is able to look into the innermost being of us. He able, He looks at the heart. He knows our heart. He doesn't merely look at our outward appearance. He knows our innermost being, what the Bible calls the heart. He penetrates the very soul of each one of us. So he's the ultimate heart doctor. And, uh, you know, if you go to a cardiologist, because you have some symptoms of heart trouble, or heart disease, they have different tests that they can put you through, EKG, whatever. They can test and, and uh, find out what, uh, exactly what the problem is regarding your heart condition if you have certain symptoms. Well, God, he searches the heart. He has the perfect test to pinpoint the problem in your soul and in mine. So he's the cardiologist. If I say we're the patients, right? If you have heart trouble, really a a physical heart trouble, you should be seeing a cardiologist, right? You should be seeing a, a heart specialist and probably have regular appointments that you see a cardiologist. Well, you know what? Believers need to make appointments with God for regular checkups, asking the Holy Spirit of God to examine your heart and to lay bare anything that displeases the Lord. Do you have regular checkups like that? You ask God to do that? Search me, O God, the psalmist says. That ought to be something that you regularly submit to. You want God to do that. And if you mean business, God knows if you're just mouthing words, if you really mean business with him, he will search your heart. He'll lay it there. He won't uh, pull any punches. He won't gloss over it. He'll show you exactly the condition of your heart because you and I can't know it apart from him searching it. The apple industry, fruit producers. Of the thousands of apples that are grown each year, some of them contain worms. Though most fruit producers will do all that they can from uh, to keep that from happening. Did you know that worms and apples? It actually they they come from the inside. You may not even know they're in there until they appear on the outside. Because what happens is when the apple tree grows these beautiful blossoms, these flowers, there is a bug that lays its egg in those blossoms 
And of course, the fruit then develops around that blossom. And when that apple is formed, that egg hatches inside the core, the middle of that apple, and then it eats its way out. <laughs> you know what's worse than finding a worm in your apple? Finding half a one. <laughs> You know, it may look like a good apple on the outside, but inside the worm's already begun its process of bringing rottenness and decay at the heart of that apple. You know, our prisons are just running over with people now, our streets, who had evil thoughts coming out of their hearts because of sin, which caused them to commit and to perpetrate all different kinds of crimes. You know what the cure is? It's not just them doing time. The only cure is they get a new heart. They have a heart change. They have a heart replacement. They have heart uh, replacement surgery. Spiritually. So the heart is deceitful. Only God can search it. Here's the third thing I want you to think about when it comes to the human heart. It can be restored. If God searches your heart and shows you some rottenness there, some sin that needs to be dealt with, guess what? That can be handled. It can be restored. The way lost people have their heart restored is they undergo an inner conversion. It's called the new birth. It's being born again. And when you're born again, you get a new heart. Did you know that Ezekiel 36 says there's coming a day when the entire nation of Israel in the future is going to be given a new heart? Ezekiel 36, 26 God promises through the prophet, a new heart will I give them. Well, that's salvation. That's what happens at salvation. People get an absolutely new heart from God. He gives them a new heart. He puts a new spirit within them. That's what Jesus meant when he said, you must be born again. you got to have a new heart. Your old heart is condemning you. So, Thankfully, God searches, but he also offers restoration. He can restore. He can restore by giving lost people that new heart. He can also cleanse the heart of God's people. That's how we get restored when our hearts have been revealed to have sin in them. Believers need a continual clean heart. Cleansing in a believer's life is not something that takes place occasionally. It happens every day if you look to the Lord. One of the most logical and helpful discoveries in medicine was, I think it happened in the 1800s, by a Dr. Samuel Weiss who realized that the uh, the obstetricians that were delivering babies were before they go, they went to the delivery room, they were practicing on cadavers and they didn't wash their hands and they would deliver the babies and they had a terrible mortality rate and even the mothers were dying and he figured it out. It's because their hands were contaminated from the, the cadavers that they were handling. And so he just, he stressed, that let's sanitize our hands. And some listen, some, but the ones that listen, that it cut down the mortality rate tremendously. Well, for a strong, healthy, spiritual heart, we need it sanitized. <laughs> Remember Jesus' prayer? Father, sanctify, sanitize them, you might say. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And the Holy Spirit of God wants to sanctify, wants to cleanse. And he does so when you are intaking 
the word of God on a regular daily basis. You're not worried about cleansing if you ignore the book. You really aren't. And so clean, uh, cleanness comes as a result of being sanctified through a diet of God's word. And, you know, your cardiologist, he'd tell you, if you got a weak heart, you need to strengthen it. You need to do some some exercise. Well, there are there's spiritual exercises that believers can do to strengthen their spiritual heart. It's called walking. Walk in the light, the Bible says. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And as a result, you'll be clean. The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all. What does it mean to walk in the light? It means to take steps of confession, of owning whatever sin the Holy Spirit searches and reveals in you. Take steps of confession. And when you do, your faith then will access cleansing. Because he says, if we confess, he is faithful to forgive and to cleanse us. So walk in the light. That's your spiritual exercise for a clean heart. God restores. There's cleanness and there's also usefulness. I mean, if you fail, if God brings things to your attention, don't give up. There's hope. You could be useful in God's purpose, in God's service again. Failure never needs to be final for the believer. Remember, again, Peter, this whole thing is because of the three denials. He was ignorant of his heart, right? He was deceived by his own heart. He thought he loved Jesus more than he really did. I'll never do that. He did it. And Jesus even warned him ahead of time, Peter, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, when you turn around, when you repent, strengthen your brethren, there's usefulness. After cleanness, there's usefulness. You can be restored. And Peter understood that in 21 of John's gospel. Three times he denied the Lord. Three times Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Love me? Three times. He's restoring him to usefulness. And then one fourth and final thing about the human heart. It's deceitful. Only God can search it accurately. And when he reveals sin there, he can restore it through cleanness and Bring usefulness out of your life. But the fourth thing about the human heart is it needs to be kept. You have to keep it. Because the heart is the command center of the human personality. Earthly life, earthly human life flows out of it. In fact, remember how Jesus puts it in that 15th chapter of Matthew, I think it is where he talks about out of the heart proceeds murder and theft and cursing and the whole list, fornication. It all comes out of the human heart. And so it has to be kept because our lives flow out of the heart. And so the writer of Proverbs says again, keep your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything flows out of your human heart. You don't realize it, but that's the truth. And that's why you have to keep it. You have to guard your heart. How do you do that? Hmm. Well, our part as believers our responsibility is, first of all, avoid taking in any known defilement. Paul says it this way. Work out your own salvation in trembling and fear. Don't allow filth into your life. He says it also in that fourth chapter of Philippians <clears throat> that we are to focus on certain things and not allow other things into our thought processes. He says, focus on things that are true. 
Focus on things that are honest. Focus on things that are just, that are right. Focus on things that are pure, not impure. Things that are lovely, not ugly. Things that are good, of good report. Things that are virtuous, things that are praiseworthy. Think on these things. So if you're going to guard your heart, you do all you can, first of all, to avoid taking in any known defilement. You don't do that deliberately. You don't expose yourself to pornography. You don't expose yourself to worldly philosophy on purpose. You try to avoid as much of that defilement as you possibly can. Some of it is in your face and you and it, it, it hits you and you're not even looking for it. But if you're looking for it, you're guarding your heart. You're being defiled, you're defiling your heart. So avoid deliberate exposure to wrong thinking, to wrong viewing, to wrong philosophy, to impurity. Philippians 4.8. Think on these things. Okay? Avoid defilement. That's our responsibility as believers to keep our heart, to guard our heart. What is the Lord's responsibility? Well, you know what he does? He does everything that we can't do. But he requires our cooperation with him. He doesn't just automatically do it. He won't guard our heart if we're not cooperating with him in the guarding of it. So we have to depend upon the Holy Spirit to give us the desire and the ability to do right, to think right. Remember, again, Philippians 2.13. You with me? Look this way so I know you're with me. Here it is, girls. This is it. It is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God gives you the desire to do right, and God gives you the ability to do right. And that's God's part. But you see, it's a cooperation with him. He won't do it if you don't cooperate. He gives you the desire, and he will give you the ability if you'll obey him, if you'll trust him, uh, to see to it that your love for him does nothing but increase. You know, I think the longer that you're a believer, the more you want to love the Lord. I think that our love for him should never die, but rather it should increase in intensity, and we should hunger for more of him all the time if he's real in our lives. I was reading in uh, First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 18 the, the other day, and it really, it, it really hit the nail on the head. First Chronicles 29 is like David's last words. He's gathered all the materials together to build the temple. But God tells him he can't build it. He's a man of war. His hands are bloody. His son, Solomon, will build it instead. But David is so thankful to God that he had the privilege of just gathering the materials that would be used to build the temple, even though he wouldn't be alive. He's rejoicing. I, I love some of the verses. In fact, I think verses 10 to 14 in 1 Chronicles 29 are verses that every Christian ought to memorize. I've worked on them, and I need to work on them again, where David just says, Oh, Lord God of our, uh, of our ancestors, your, your, yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty. And he goes on to say in the 14th verse, Who am I? And what is this, my people, that we could give anything to you, for everything that we have has come from you, and we are only giving you back what you first gave to us. That's the gist of the verse. And then in, in chapter uh, 29, and in verse 18, here's what he says. He says, 
I know also, my God, that you try, that you test the heart. This is verse 17. And you have pleasure in uprightness. Let me just, uh, again, translate what he said. I know, God, you examine the heart, and you rejoice when you find integrity in our hearts. And he says, I have uh, willingly offered all these things. And now I have seen with joy your people that are present here. They offer willingly to you. And he says, O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and of Israel, our fathers, our ancestors, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their hearts unto thee. Basically, he's saying, O oh God, make your people always want to live like this. Make them always want to give to you. Make them always want to obey you. See to it that their love for you never, ever changes that it rather grows more intense over time. I think that's a pretty good summary of the heart.